Good evening. Separatism has disappeared from view in Quebec, but if, you, if you've been watching Howard Polly of Manitoba lately, you'd be wondering what's going to happen in the West if the Mulroney government keep up their performance. But first, here's Steve with a rundown. Eddie Hamer was all smiles when he unveiled his plans for Rattlesnake Island. Fifteen years later, the court says he's a victim of a government conspiracy. The saga of Eddie Hamer tonight on Webster. But first, is Canada's foreign assistance money well spent, and where does it go? For the first time in 15 years, the government is trying to find out. Tonight, Liberal MP Don Johnson, member of the Parliamentary Committee on External Affairs. I want you to shout head or tails. I'll tell you why. If it's heads, we talk about my topics first. If it's tails, we talk about yours. Then you better let me flip. No, no, <laughs> tails. tails. It's heads. <laughs> Can I have a look at that? <laughs> Double-headed quarter? No. Let's get down to business. A lot of people are mystified by the absolute silence from the Liberal Party on what Western Canadians think is a scandal. The granting of the CF-18 contract to Canada and Montreal, when the best bid came from Winnipeg, from Bristol Aerospace, and the best technical evaluation. And now with some phony technological transfer, Moroni gives it to Montreal. Well, they, I don't think there's What do the silent. Liberals think about this? Well, I, I haven't been in the House, but from reading what's happened in the House, uh, John Turner's been up on the subject. I want to hear Don Johnson on well, the I'll subject. I'll tell you what I think. I think the process has to be fair and seen as fair. And at the moment, the process is not seen as fair, and I think the government has to come clean and tell the Canadian public upon what basis they made the decision. If they made it on a strictly political basis, they're going to pay the price at the, at the polls. What would the Liberals have done? Remembering, of course, that who controls Quebec controls Canada. 75 seats in Quebec, 14 seats in Manitoba. Uh, it's a Tory popularity are way down in Quebec. Well, with the Tory popularity way down in Quebec, uh, what would the Liberals have done, are you saying? No, no. What would you have done if you'd been in the same position? I mean, in terms of these regional contracts. Right. Well, someone said to me the other day, you probably would have put the engines in Manitoba and you would have put part of the contract in Canada and you would have put a part of the contract in Halifax. Because remember, IMP was also one of the uh, contenders in this. Uh, but look, hypothetical questions like that, how can I answer them without knowing all the facts? I don't know the basis of the evaluation. But I know one thing, it appears to be unfair. And in politics, perception is reality. Well, the liberals, uh, uh, liberals in the West would expect you to come at least to the sympathetic aid of Manitoba. And perhaps you would advocate, too, that we get the big icebreaker in British Columbia. Well, there again, is the bidding process fair? Should the icebreaker come to British Columbia if there's a if there's a better bid from somewhere else. That's the issue that has to be decided in all these these. Do questions. we have a political party that's prepared to govern this country on a basis of economy with efficiency? Or will it always be done in a kind of broad payola to help the major parties sagging polls? Well, look, I think in this country you have to have a bidding system which represents regional interests as well. You can't let an industry go down in British Columbia if, if some business can go into it. You can't let one go down in Quebec. You can't let one go down in uh, St. John, New Brunswick. I think that there is a means, usually, as we did with the frigate contract, of trying to get some work into various areas. Canadians understand that. Here, that's not the issue. The issue is, was the process fair? Well, I'm glad you mentioned your days, because the Liberals created a $200 million job creation program in 1982, distributed according to need, it said. Finished up that Quebec, with less than 30% of the unemployed, got half of the money. BC, with 14%, got 4% uh, of the jobs. The same old thing under the Liberals. Can you blame Westerners for being just a little bit more than alienated with all of your houses in the East? I think Westerners have had a lot of legitimate complaints over the years. But a lot of good things have happened in British Columbia as well over the years. You just came out of Expo 86. Do you think Expo 86 wouldn't have happened without the Liberal government? Do you think Northeast Coal would have happened without the Liberal government? You can talk about the merits of the project or not. Do you think Robert's ba the bank would have happened without the Liberal government? Do you Robert's think the bank. work on Rogers Pass would have happened without the Liberal government? I mean, we can go on and on and on. I thought that we made a very substantial effort to get activity and jobs into British Columbia. And we did not have members here. We had some senators here. Uh, but, of course, uh, you know, again, we're always going to be criticized. But on the broad thesis, this, uh, this was once said to be an ungovernable country. I'm beginning to think it is. No, it's not ungovernable. It's damn hard, but it's not ungovernable. Mm. Just one sharp, sharp question on the leadership. 
We hear that you're going to give up your seat in St. Henri Westmont, I think it is, <laughs> to make room for this new rising star that nobody in the West knows, Paul Martin Jr. <laughs> I haven't heard that. I've been told that, but uh, certainly no decision of that kind has been made by me. Are you a Turner man all the way? I have been with Turner since he was elected. He's the leader of the party, and uh, there it is. And you'll vote uh, against the leadership rev review? My intention is to vote against the leadership review. Fair enough. Now, what do you want to talk about? The Canadian International? I want to talk about, about what brought me to British Columbia. It's CEDA. Which is the, that's right, which is our official development uh, aid, which is, and CEDA, of course, is the vehicle for that aid. And uh, basically, the committee's undergoing a review. We spent $2.5 billion on foreign aid, and Canadians want to know that it's being spent effectively, efficiently, and doing the things that uh, Canadians want done in these developing countries. Now, far be it from me, and my tongue is in my cheek, and I don't want to sound like Van der Zam precisely or exactly, but we've got a province that's wrecked by strikes and lockouts. Those not on unemployment insurance are on welfare. I know where you're and coming we from. And we say $2.5 billion in foreign aid when we've got food banks in British Columbia. Uh, yes, I know. It's, it's a difficult sell, but the fact is that the poorest Canadian, mm -hmm. the poorest Canadian is better off than most of the people in the third world countries. But apart from the humanitarian aspects of it, a point that I made this afternoon is this. If we don't raise the standard of living in the third world, mm -hmm. the future of this planet is by no means assured. Never mind the East-West conflict, because that's the only way we will have zero population growth. Mm -hmm. Without that, all the numbers show us that the planet will be overrun because, unfortunately, poverty breeds people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very much in our interest to ensure that that standard of living is raised as quickly as possible. Yeah, I realize that my interpretation was a cheap shot, but at the same time, there are people who will say foreign aid, modern aid, right? There are a lot of people that will say that, and it's the job of people like you on programs like this to tell them why they're wrong and to tell them that it's not only humanitarian, but it's in their long-term interests. How do we stand in our percentage of GNP that we give? Well, we're running about point, uh, between 0.4 and 0.5, and we're shooting for 0.7, I hope, by 1990. The Conservatives, I don't want to be partisan on this, but the Conservatives have cut back the commitment to foreign aid. But I can't think of any place better for us to put our money. But I would prefer, prefer to see it, and that's one of the reasons I'm interested in these, in these uh, proceedings, I prefer to see it in the education of those people from third world countries, preferably in Canadian universities. Well, you, you, you put it much better than Crosby did when he told the people in the Atlantic seaboard they'd be better off in Bangladesh. But that's better off than the people in Bangladesh. Yeah. But that's, in effect, what we must say. Is it not so? No, that's not a, in those words. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that we're a very privileged people mm -hmm. and we're a very wealthy country. And if we have any any obligation to the future constituency, which is the generations to come, we have to address this problem. The other thing that's important about it is it's hard for us to get into the great nuclear debate. We can comment from the side, we can urge the Americans, we can right. push the Russians, but here we can put our money where our mouths are. Is it a positive side too that that 2.5 billion, which ain't all that much, that kind of air contract, 1.4 billion, <laughs> <laughs> it ain't all that much, does supply jobs in Canada, does it? Of course it supplies jobs in Canada. The, much of it, in fact, uh, probably more than 50% of it is what we call tied aid. That's a contentious issue also. Is that the best form of aid for these countries? You mean they've, they've got to buy the stuff in this country? That's we right. Send they the buy, people? they use Canadian contractors. We have, we finished all the, the world. have we finished all the stupid projects? The best one I can remember about was a Canadian aid program which sent a, a factory to make plastic sandals in Egypt. The plastic sandals were irreparable. You couldn't do anything with them. And this new Canadian factory put God knows how many Egyptians out of work who'd been making sandals out of cow hides for years. Well, I, look, I, it, that must have happened before I was president of the Treasury Board, Jack. I don't remember that, but I'm sure that there are many examples of that kind of waste. Mm -hmm. We had others, too. There have been mistakes. Anyway. A lot of mistakes. But that's one of the purposes of this committee to put in better control mechanisms to improve the quality of aid and hopefully improve the quantity of aid. We're going to go to the phones, Donald. Now, you're, you're never going to run for the leadership again. Is that correct? I have no intention of running for the leadership. But you're a staunch Turner liberal. 
Well, of course I'm a turn. Turner's the, the leader of the party. You and I were sitting here at this desk when he declared his leadership. Do you remember? Back yes, I do. That was it. 1984. Was that the day you played the piano? That's the day you sang. <laughs> <laughs> Your questions to Don Johnson. Very bright for a liberal from Westmount. Off to the break. Sound easy. Are you worried there are no calls? Yeah, I'm worried there are no calls. Okay, we're on the air again. Just Might in get one case. Don Johnson, Liberal MP, Sir Henri Westmount. Sally Westmount. I got it right this time. Go ahead to John Johnson from Kelowna. Hello. Hello, Jack. Yeah. To that creep last night that called. Hello. Go on, carry on. Say your piece. Here we go again. New audience, new type. Oh, all right. You turn down your television sound or you'll go crazy. Turn it down? Yes, turn it down. He should do his homework. Who, who's that you're talking about? Who are you talking about? That guy that phoned in last night. He should do his homework. I think you'd do a damn good job. You're supposed to talk to Don Johnson. This was <laughs> a guy who phoned up last night and the listener called him a creep. Creep who said I was over the hill and it was time I quit. He may be right. <laughs> go ahead to Don Johnson. Hello, Jack? Yeah. Yes, as a retired professor, uh, I was interested in his comment about uh, using CEDA as a means of educating people in third world countries, because over 10 years ago, I went to a senator from, uh, a liberal senator from this province, who eventually got in touch with CEDA, and they turned the idea down. But I personally think that's one of the best investments of our funds, is to train leaders in the third world. Don? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that other countries have done this. France has been, uh, has been an expert at it, and so has Russia. And, the, and you established long-term relationships. We have some, as a matter of fact. Some leaders in the third world educating Canadian universities maintain a loyalty to this country, are familiar with it. But that's uh, not the kind of education you're talking about with CETA, is it? Oh, yes, absolutely. I thought you meant the educational projects of the people in these oh, countries. No, both. Bringing scholarship students to Canada into our universities. Mm -hmm. In our universities, I understand in, in British Columbia, actually, there's been some increase. But in the rest of Canada, there's been a de decrease in foreign students because of the fee structures, mm -hmm. because we have higher fee structures for them. I think we should use much more CETA money to bring students here. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yep. Yeah, I've got a comment on one of the statements Mr. Johnson made about our, the, our hope for the future resting with increasing the uh, income in the third world and reducing the population. I would th think that's not really the point that should be made, but the point is that um, the Western world uses 75% of the resources consumed every year, and instead of raising the income of those third world people, maybe we should be concerned with decreasing the uh, use of resources, consumption of resources in the Western world. That's where our hope lies not okay. in raising the income of third world people where greater consumption of resources. Okay, what do you say to that? Well, I prefer to make other people um, wealthier rather than making everybody poorer. I mean, but it is a fact. The, the, the resources of the world are unfairly shared and used. Absolutely. If and you're looking at them from another planet. Well, of course, but that doesn't... How, how, how does... How does using less of the resources raise the standard of livings of people in the third world? I guess that's the question I put to the listener. Go the ahead. Viewer. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yep. Yeah, I was uh, just wondering how could uh, he possibly justify giving extra money to the, uh, to the foreign nations when in British Columbia alone, as a small businessman and a person that attends a post-secondary educational institute, I'm having problems in both areas. And uh, I was wondering, how can they possibly spend money on other nations when we've got a lot of concerns right here in British Columbia and in Canada as well? Okay, that's the question I put to you before. Try well, I answered the question I thought before. You know, the per capita income of some of these countries is uh, $300, $400 a year, in some case maximum. In Canada, it's between uh, somewhere between 11 and 13,000 now, probably around 12 per year. Um, I'm saying that you have, we have to recognize that, that the worst circumstances in Canada are in many cases almost the best apart from the elite in some of these third world countries. Go ahead please. Yes sir. Um, it's more of a, uh, not a, really a question, it's more of a comment. I agree with Mr. Johnson about poverty breeds overpopulation, but I think it's more poverty breeds ignorance and ignorance breeds population because it's the ignorant people that have all the children. The more educated, the more intelligent people have fewer children. Am I wrong? Speaks for itself. 
Well, I, you know, the, the two are perhaps in, inseparable in that regard, and that's why the accent has to be on education. Um, we're in a period in this world where the most important single resource of any country is up there. It's no longer in the ground. It's no longer just our trees. It's what we do with it, and that's, that's up here. The Japanese and the Swiss have shown us that. But it's significant that the calls at least have been on CEDA and not on my topics. Well, they knew that your comments were totally irrelevant to to the issue that we and, were here to discuss. And their response. We lost, we lost, you lost the flip. You won the flip. And, and I lost losing the debate. Lost it in the debate. <laughs> Go ahead, please. But I had no option. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yeah. Mr. Johnson, I'd like to know your feelings and the Liberal Party's feelings on uh, the Indian land came issue in British Columbia, especially the Queen Charlotte's, which I think this area should be preserved in its natural state as it has lost hold for my grandchildren. Could I have a South Morrisby and so on? Well, the, the environmental minister, our environmental critic, Charles Katcher, has been out there and uh, has... He was one of the least informed ministers I have ever come across. Well, I know, Jack, uh, we should hear from you on this because you're one of the most informed people on the issue. No, I'm, I've taken a side on the issue. I believe there's room for both in Moresby, and I strongly object to federal cabinet ministers, especially Tory cabinet ministers, who tell us they'll give us $20 million and solve the whole thing. They have no conception in, in eastern Canada, central Canada, what British Columbia's needs are now, as well as a fair settlement of the Indian land claims, which must come one day. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Johnson, what the hell's the difference between him, his Liberal Party and the, the Conservative Party? They're all uh, pork barrel. I got... Uh, okay, I've got you. It says you're all in the pork barrel. <laughs> Well, that expresses the, the kind of cynicism that I wrote about in the, in the book, which I published earlier this year. On the hill. Yeah, up the hill. Up the is, hill. Which uh, is very distressing. I mean, I, I think that it, it's that uh, attitude, which, uh, which is understandable. When you even look at Parliament and the antics in Parliament, I can understand people being uh, very discouraged to the point of thinking the whole process is irrelevant. 41 million extra for a, a prison in Port Cartier. Mm? $150 million on the PM's writing in Manicouagan. Well, but I, we put you all in the same battle, don't we? Well, I don't want to have to go back and go over the record and say this was good or this was bad. The, the point is that there's a plague on both our houses. Uh, I know that. Um, but I, I find this kind of move of the prison to, to, um, to his writing absolutely unacceptable from every point of view, from an economic point of view, from a humanitarian point of view, and, of course, from the waste of public funds point of view. Just one final broad question. You won't have time to reply to it in detail, unfortunately. Broadbent sure came up, coming up in the polls. Is it not nearing the time when the left-wing liberals will have to join the right-wing NDP so that we can get back to a reasonable two-party system in this country? You would be on the left of the center there, wouldn't you? Well, I think I'm a liberal which is uh, basically center. I mean, the other parties have been scrambling to acquire that terrain, Broadbent scrambling to acquire it. How often do you hear Ed Broadbent talk about his, uh, with his union or his agreement with the, ND, with the, uh, with the Canadian uh, Labor Congress? With the Canadian Labor Congress. You never hear it these days. Mm -hmm. that, he's trying to play that down. He wants people to forget that he is the leader of big labor in government. Um, so, similarly, uh, Brian Mulroney is trying to pretend that he's a liberal. But you've got to leave by expressing the good news the, liberal got, the liberals got in the recent election here. They went from 2.6 to 6.8% ah, of the vote. Well, that may be small potatoes, but look at the national poll. Look what happened in Alberta. We picked up a seat in Saskatchewan. One. We've, won, we've won Quebec. We hold effectively Ontario. New Brunswick's going to come along. Um, we've got PEI. It's a, Big, different picture from the last one time. One day, Peterson will be Prime Minister of Canada, won't he? He could very easily be. My thanks to Donald Johnson uh, on his uh, Canadian International Development Agency committee meetings in Vancouver, along with all the other politicians. Next, the saga of Eddie Hamer. <laughs> Ten years ago, the face and the actions of this man, Eddie Hamer, were on the TV screens and the newspaper headlines throughout the world, because he was then doing what appeared to be the unforgivable thing. He was holding hostages in the Canadian Embassy in Beirut, demanding the right to have justice in Canada. 
And like everybody else in the world, I thought, oh, that guy's out of his mind. Who the devil does he think he is? Ten years later, this man's quest for justice proves that he was right. And it was said of him at the time that he had a persecution complex. But when the judge in British Columbia finally came to say that Amor was right, he said, and I must find this particular quote right away, he said, experts concluded that Hamor was being believed he was being persecuted by government officials. On the evidence before me, said Mr. Justice McKinnon, he was justified in having the belief that he did. In other words, he was being persecuted by government officials. And the judge in that same decision, which gave him damages, I'm telling you about, said that he, the judge, was satisfied that the senior officials of the government of British Columbia, including cabinet ministers, and with the knowledge of Premier, the office of Premier of W.A.C. Bennett, contrived to do him down. It's quite unbelievable the things they did to him. Lost his family, lost his sanity, lost his liberty for 21 months, lost his reputation, lost his business, lost his home, and of course he lost the island. Well, Eddie Hamer, the man who held the hostages in Beirut, while he's won one major action, is not finished yet. Eddie, it's a terribly complicated story, is it not? Very sad story, uh, Mr. Webster. Back in 1971, you bought a little island. Where was the island? In Okanagan Lake. What's it called? It was uh, Okopogo Island, and uh, they call it Rattlesnake Island, Sunshine Island, so it has a few names. What did you pay for it at that time? I paid uh, $27,000. And what were you going to do with it? I was going to establish uh, a tourist attraction because it, uh, Okanagan, uh, the lack of these tourist uh, facilities for the tourists, and a beautiful country there. You were going to put a pitch and putt golf course? Uh, mini golf course, yes. Mini golf course, yes. you had a huge concrete camel of some kind? Uh, yes, it was an uh, ice cream camel for the children, so they could jump up and uh, have an ice cream. And many other things you were going to do? Yes. Uh, what went wrong? Were you ahead of your time or behind your time? Did, did, you get, did you have knowledge that you could do these things when you bought the island? Of course I do. You know, I, I've been in Canada at that time for 18 years, and I have took up courses on laws and uh, courses on management. Taxes. When did it begin to go wrong? It became uh, just uh, shortly after I started it, uh, really. When, uh, when I bought the island, I want to see the government mm -hmm. to seek some uh, uh, permit of some kind of permissions. And then they began to close in on you. And then they jump on me. Uh, they said you had no sewage, you had no right to sewage, no foreshore leases. They didn't want you to do a damn thing, is that correct? All of those. Let uh, me jump to, to Mr. Hamer's lawyer, Jack Cram, and summarize for me what happened thereafter. Well, I think you should go back. First of all, first of all, he was told that he had the right to do it, that he was within his rights. Because, because there, there were was, very few regulations There were the no time. regulations so far as what he could use the island for. And on that, with legal advice confirming that, he proceeded. After he was well underway is when they started to come down on him. And they said they passed a building regulation to try and stop him, directed aimly at him. They passed zoning regulations to stop him, zoning the island out of existence almost. They, pa uh, they, they imposed health regulations beyond what the regulations were. They tried to stop him from getting access to the island. Now, how are you supposed to get to an island if you can't go across the lake? But anyways, they tried to stop him, and um, they almost even denied him the use of water, even though it's in the middle of a lake. Uh, they tried everything. So this went on from after 1971 until about 1973, didn't it? It started in the fall of 71, and it, they kept it up until Eddie Hamar cracked. Frankly. What do you mean he cracked? Mentally. And he was broke as well. By the middle of 73, he was financially ruined and mentally broken. Mm-hmm. And that was about the middle of 73. Yeah. And then, unfortunately, he took certain action which resulted in criminal charges against him. Yes. What were these charges against him? Oh, there was a whole slew of them. There was about 38 of them. 
And uh, as far as I'm concerned, probably none of them had any foundation. But there was a threat of letter bombs against the Premier well, the or something. Letter bombs were just letters. There was nothing in them. But they said there was. So when he came up for trial on that, what happened to him? Well, they proceeded on one charge, and that was a charge of possession of a set of Charles knuckle dusters. And they knew that he, Eddie would get out right away because he had no previous record whatsoever. In fact, he had in, a perfect record. And uh, they knew he would get out right away if there was a finding of not guilty, of course, or if guilty finding. So they proceeded to enter a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity for Eddie. They did? Yes, the government. And they found you insane? Unusual, yeah. Sorry. They found you insane? Yes. Why were you insane at that time? Well, I think that's a question for a psychiatrist, and that's also a question that's still before the courts. So I think oh, we we'll leave, leave that, that alone. alone. Yeah. Certainly, he was in a, a, a tense emotional state at that time. But there were funny things happened when he was. How long were, how long were you in Riverview? Eleven months and nine months in jail. Total of twenty months. Twenty months. What happened to the island while he was in jail? Well, while he was in jail, waiting trial. In fact, in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the courtroom, after he'd spent the night in jail uh, down below. Uh, he signed a deed to the island in favor of the government. Well, how could he, if he's in jail because of a mental condition, how could the government dare to let him sign a deed giving them the island for how much money? $40,000. That you owed at that time? That I owed against it, yes. How could they do that? Eddie, I should add, had spent 150000 on it by that time improving it, over and above the cost of the island itself. So, uh, and how could they do it? Good question. Well, of course, uh, uh, I'm told that, and I see from what the judge, uh, Gordon McKinnon, said, that there were a number of government departments nailed to the cross in his judgment for doing the wrong things. Yes. Now, but he, he was supposed, you were supposed to be suffering from paranoia, were you not? That's what they said. Let me quote the judge again. I think you've got to put this on the record. All experts agreed, agree that Hamor was suffering paranoia and that he had delusions. They concluded he believed he was being persecuted by government officials. On the evidence before me, that's the judge, the Supreme Court judge, he was justified in having the belief that he was being persecuted by the government. So, uh, You see, it was interesting, a lot of the psychiatrists clear. did not believe he was justified. Did not believe he was justified. Right. But the judge said he was. I mean, who would believe that Premier W.A.C. Bennett would persecute anybody? Mm -hmm. At that time. Well, it says the office of W.A.C. Bennett, which, of course, directly ties in the Premier's he office. He said the Premier earlier. He said Did the you? Premier. No yeah. less than six departments involved in a conspiracy. What was that conspiracy? A conspiracy to prevent him from developing his island? Yes. Lands, municipal affairs, health, attorney generals, highways, and provincial secretary. Now, you finally got back from Beirut. What did you do then? I came uh, looking for a settlement, and they stonewalled me and started pushing me around and round and round. And Did you have any money at the time? None. None? None. More of the incredible story of Eddie Hamor and his partial victory after the break. <laughs> this is the first time in all my reporting in British Columbia for nearly 40 years that I have seen such a condemnation of a conspiracy by bureaucrats and politicians against an individual who undoubtedly was held up to ridicule and contempt at a time when he was later proven to be right and very nearly justified in everything he did because if he hadn't taken the hostages in Beirut, not even a partial successful conclusion would have come about. Is that correct, Jack Cram? Well, I don't know. I, I certainly think it brought his plight to the attention of a lot of people and uh, made them take him seriously. Well, when he came back, what happened? Uh, did you finally start it in action? Yes. Well, after Stone walled me for uh, a nearly a year, and then I became uh, hopeless of trying to reach a settlement with them. Uh, peacefully, without court and cost, because I did don't Did you have, have any money at the time? I didn't have no money. Then I want to seek a lawyer who can take my case on contingency. I want to Mr. Dancer, who is a member in Parliament today. But he, then he became elected to the House of Commons and had to let go of the he case, let, did he, he not? Let, he let go to a lower... Uh... Is the McKinnon judgment the final result of his long travail to get in through the court successfully? It may not be the end, but it's the end so far as we've gotten so far. What has he won so far? 
Uh, in dollars? No, the, the, the broad settlement given by the judge. Well, basically what he's won is $150,000, or going back to 1974, it's $70,000 compared to approximately 150 dollars he'd spent at that time. And you've got to remember the 1974 dollars translate to a lot more nowadays. And you add to that interest for 12 years, which brings it up to about $150,000, plus solicitor and client costs, which is a form of a slap in the wrist on the government, which is more than the court normally awards saying, listen, you have acted reprehensibly here. Unfortunately, the court was not allowed for technical reasons, not, nothing to do with the merits, but they were not allowed to deal with Eddie's own personal suffering, the loss of his sanity and the time he spent in jail. And the, the loss of his wife. And his children and everything. He lost everything at the hands of the government. So finally, when, when the McKinnon judgment came down, he got something more than $200,000. He got an extra 67 for the, for the island, Over right? the 40 that they'd given him. Over the 40 they'd given him, plus interest, plus costs. Yes. Now, is he not entitled? You said he, he couldn't sue for certain things. What can he not sue for? Because of what is called the Crown Procedure Act, an act that was repealed in 1974, believe it or not, Shortly after this all happened, the Court of Appeal decided two years ago that Eddie could not pursue his own personal claims against the government, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. The only thing he could pursue was a claim for compensation regarding the price paid for the island. So, for the two years he spent in jail and a mental hospital, he could not even make a claim. There's no comment on the merits of his claim he just couldn't pursue it. Legally, technically disqualified uh, from going after them for what I believe the judge caused, for instance, the six and a half month period awaiting trial, which was torture. Yes. Were you moved constantly while you were awaiting trial? I went to the court about 46 times. 40? 46. They stripped me completely naked about n over 90 times. So twice every time they take me to court, they have to take my clothes off one way and this is a man who's been in jail one... in his life. July the 5th, which was set for July the 5th, 74. You were moved constantly, kept overnight in cells with limited amenities, and, and you were supposed to be mental case at the time. Supposed to be helped instead of hurt more. Were you getting any treatment for your so-called mental condition? Not even an aspirin for 20 months that they kept me in. It's almost unbelievable to believe this could happen. It could have happened in British yeah. Columbia. It's worse than fiction, it really is. In you the 70s. So, okay. okay. As he, he's, he's, you're going to collect this two hundred odd thousand dollars, including some interest and whatnot. Well, it's all hung up in appeals now, I might say. Well, that's a normal course of appeal with which you're not concerned. On this occasion, we're concerned with your inability to sue, or Eddie's inability to sue for the extraordinary personal damages and loss because of this conspiracy. You know what the theory is? No. The crown can do no wrong. Unless the believe? Crown says, you may sue me. Isn't that ironic? Yes. Now, so therefore, what avenue is open for Eddie, having recovered a small piece of money, what avenue is open for Eddie to get what people must obviously want to give him, some form of financial compensation? Very simply, for this present-day government to look at this thing... Darkness falls early these days, and the World's Fair is over. But the city isn't closed, far from it. Remember the limousines on Pender Street and the champagne that flowed as the stock market boomed? Viva, a landmark five years ago, has reopened. It's six o'clock on opening night, and they're still putting the carpet down. Good evening, welcome, welcome to ma'am. How are you today? Welcome to Vivas. Yeah. Sir, have a nice evening. Yeah. They've sent invitations to the names from the old Viva membership list of years ago. Who's turned out? Here's Robert Gardner, the lawyer. Ralph Caravetta, the hotelier. Mayor, the talk show host. And Ron and Dana Zolko, celebrity parents. The feeling will be more of a drop-in feeling as opposed to planning for a night and then going and spending a night at Viva. 
It'd be more a drop-in situation, casual, like a cafe, like a European cafe, where you can go and have cappuccino, espresso, a nice chocolate cake, maybe a glass of dessert wine. Viva of 1981 was known for touch dancing, and there's some of that here. But the rich feel of velvet is gone. The cafe floor is just concrete with a clever paint job. The new Viva caters to a younger, less affluent crowd. Hey, the real club is Richards on Richards. No matter what anybody else tells you, everybody wishes they could be Richards on Richards. And I'll say, you may have been done an injustice, but you, you really have such a persecution complex and your files are so thick that nobody can help you. I think you'll agree that sometimes happens. People on the fringes give up and say, Ah, it's impossible, such a mess. And you were telling me about some time you were driving in the car when I was on the radio with Simmer Holt. Yes. What did we do to you that day? Well, you, uh, Jacques, really, you hurt my feeling very badly at that time, and I, let me say it clearly. Like you and that uh, Simmer Holt, she was a member in Parliament at that time. Uh, a, a lady, she called, and she said, uh, this man, Haymore, he have took the Canadian embassy hostages, and now he's free with us. It must be he have some kind of reason to be free. Why don't you put him on and put the fact, uh, let's hear the fact. So right away, both of you, with the same tone, same time, uh, this man should be in jail. And I felt, oh my God. Uh, you will accept my apologies, <laughs> will you? At that <laughs> time, that was my automatic response to a man who had been charged with threatening all kinds of people, and who had gone into the Canadian Embassy, but I was wrong. I, I, I was being pushed into it. I wouldn't sure. want to hurt anyone, Jack. Can I suggest there's two lessons to be learned here? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking for, the lessons. One is that we are too quick to dismiss complaints about government and other misconduct, and we should listen. Secondly, our politicians are too busy trying to get elected rather than taking care of the problems of people. And they wouldn't listen to Eddie Hamor, and that's why all of this happened. They wouldn't listen to him. But you see... And to this very day, that's still happening. The enormity of the conspiracy is laid out in the judge's decision. It was the judge who said that he, he has concluded there was, as early as October of 71, ministers of the Crown had an understanding, including Premier, that would be W.A.C. Bennett, uh, that the full force of the government will be used against yes. his plans. That's point number one. Yeah. Point number two, that they all, knowledge of the office of the Premier as well, contrived to curb improperly his development, right? Yeah. And they subjected him to a charade of pretending they would approve his applications for permits when they decided they would not do so. It was highly improper, if not consciously cruel, and then we go on to the discriminatory regulations, deceptive and misleading treatment from the lands department, deceptive and misleading on the sewage, sham processing of applications, Hamer allowed to entertain false hope, the island had been zoned out of all possible uses, and they'd acted unfairly in four or five other ways. It's, a, it's an object lesson in what bureaucrats and politicians can get away with if you don't listen to the people who appear to be a little bit paranoid. And it goes on all the time, I might say. Well, best of luck. Thanks. I hope that Smith and whatever government is in power come through with a proper compensation. Quick. That was taped before the recent election. I've spoken to the Attorney General, Mr. Brian Smith, and he tells me he has the file and he will review it at the earliest possible date. Um, and I'll be back with a free-for-all after the break. Well, free-for-all to finish the program. I promised to do more free-for-alls anyway, and I kind of like them. Um, go ahead, please. Oh, Jack? Yes? Jack, you knew W.A.C. Bennett well. I knew the man. I can't understand. One thing I've never understood in the whole coverage of this thing, though there have been allusions to it, and there was in this tape uh, that you just showed, uh, what did W.A.C. Bennett, he didn't seem like a venal man and ever, in my experience, 
why did he go after uh, Hamor and then use all the departments of the government against him, has been, has been said. Well, it's not, it's not suggested that he did everything. Let me quote from page 58 of the judgment. And the judge says, I have concluded that unbeknownst to, to the plaintiff, there was as early as October 71, yeah, and I'm, just a minute, let me finish. An understanding among the ministers of the Crown, including the Premier, that the full force of the government would be, would be invoked to prevent the lands being used as an amusement park. Now, the amusement park, there's not much soil on the island with its giant camels and whatnot, might well have been regarded as a potential eyesore for the Okanagan. I think that is, you've got to kind of imply from that and it might have been an eyesore. I don't know, but uh, there was that a That sounds like W.A.C. Bennett to you, to be so petty. What sometimes happens, though, is that the unspoken wish, and I've seen this happen in newspapers, reflects all the way down the line. You know, the unspoken wish. Just saying, oh, for goodness sake, we don't want an amusement park there. That's the only offhand interpretation I can give you, but I, it might make sense. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, you know, the basic issue is here is, here is uh, the abuse of legislative and administrative power by people in government. And I, I, I'm, I'd like to draw some parallels between this issue that you discussed and one that's going on now that affects a small group of people in a similar way. And that's the refusal of this government to give billing numbers to doctors. Now, I know it's not a popular thing to try and get sympathy for doctors in the media, but this is something that's going on at this very time. People Do forgive me, I thought that had been overcome. I thought there was a judgment. That's exactly right. Certainly in the Everybody family. has that impression, but that's not the case. There was a case that was won unequivocally by the doctors. In Kamloops? Yes. Approximately a month later, the government started doing it again. Well, and has continued to do it until this day. Are you a doctor who can't get a billing number? Exactly. How long have you been in BC as a doctor? Two and a half years. And what does the college tell you? Or what does the BC Medical Association tell you? Uh, big disappointment. This, the, 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 the government's been very canny by uh, dividing the, the established doctors well, I must from confess, doctors I thought, in my position. I thought that had been settled under the charter bit. You're, you're not alone. Doctors in this province think that. Well, I'll put it on my list to talk to BC Medical. I'd love to come on your program sometime. Well, don't hang up and my... Uh, uh, Steve will take your number on line two, Steve. Two, you know, two. Great. Okay, hold on, and I'll talk to you. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Webster. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, I, speaking as a person who's lived in the Okanagan for 19 years, I just moved out to Vancouver three years ago, uh, I would say that that park on Rattlesnake Island would have been a definite eyesore. I can remember when um, the park, I mean the island, had a beautiful sprinkling of trees on it and sagebrush, and now all it has is uh, the chintzy ruins of Mr. Haymore's pipe dream and knapweed. Well, now, I'm prepared to believe you, ma'am, but when the courts say so bluntly and with such detail that this man had been misled, uh, treated deceptively, been put through a cruel charade, had been in prison and in uh, Riverview for a total of 20 months, I find that the, the Rattlesnake Island aspect of it disappears from consideration because we must expect the highest standard of conduct from our bureaucrats who can only be all-powerful within the law. Well, maybe so, Mr. Webster, That's but I the hope to God thing. that he never gets Rattlesnake Island back. Better than one, minis, minis, one guilty man go free than whatever it is about the guilty. Yes, I guess so. Thank you very much, ma'am. Bye. You can't narrow your consideration down to Rattlesnake Island. I mean, it could have been any legal issue which upset those in authority. And when a man with a fight like this finally gets his little charter of rectitude, he must be recognized for that. Go ahead, please. Uh, Campbell River? Campbell River. Uh, may I make a political comment, uh, Jack? I, last time I talked with you, it was on the question of capital punishment and we are more or less in agreement. This time I want to congratulate you on your selection of uh, Donald Johnson as a guest. Uh, should it, I am with Iona Campanola in that I am for the present leader, right, the Right Honorable John Turner, uh -huh. but should it occur or happen that we are in need of another man, Donald Johnson as a uh, product of the Ottawa Valley would be most acceptable to Canada. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. 
product of the Ottawa Valley. It doesn't give him any edge in my books. He's a nice guy. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Yeah. I just wanted to tell you that uh, I appreciated your interview with uh, Jack Monroe. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to compliment Jack Monroe for all his labors in this province to uh, keep the average working man in a decent standard of living and not let his... Uh, uh, his work record and his and his career become part-time jobs or contracted out uh, uh, and have his standard of living lowered, which seems to be the uh, trend in this province ever since uh, Premier Bennett brought in the uh, restraint program. And if it wasn't for people like uh, Jack Monroe, every working person would be worse off. I must tell you that I have, I'm, I'm more concerned about the current IWA dispute and its disastrous effect on labor relations in British Columbia than any other labor dispute I've seen in all my years as a reporter in British Columbia. Well, Jack, I could give you one to compare to it. What one? That's the BC Transit dispute of three summers ago, when the transit workers no. were locked out for three and a half months. There was a lockout that was... But there was, not, there was not the same intent to change the whole basis of a union contract. There was an intent by the government at that time to bring in a uh, focus on part-time employees. And they tried it on us because they figured if they could bring it in on our job, they could bring it in on any job, and we stopped them. And uh, I, I consider that a victory for us, and Good. I hope Jack uh, Monroe leads the IWA to the same kind of victory to protect standards of living and uh, enough, not a I, member of the B.C. Fed. I've got but, to leave uh, you there. I've got to leave you there. It's the toughest dispute I've seen, and I'll be back after the break. I've got a couple of experts here tomorrow on the very worrying problem of the incurable disease, AIDS. We've got to talk about that from time to time, whether we want to or whether we don't. So if you wish, join me tomorrow when Webster at 5 p.m. precisely, and stay tuned for Tony.